Good morning, everybody. Welcome here. Welcome, especially all the visitors that are here. Glad you guys can make it. If you're uh, part of the Open Door family, always glad you can be here. My name is Jason, one of the pastors here at the Open Door. And, uh, and I'm glad you're here this morning because I, I want to talk about a very special event that happened in, uh, in the Antarctic in 2013. Not a lot of special events happened in the Antarctic, let alone in 2013. But in February of that year, the research station Outpost Haley came online. And this thing is a, is a marvel of human engineering because, you see, uh, it's designed to study uh, weather and, and climate and, uh, and uh, specifically it has to do with changing and fluctuations of seasonal temperatures. And, and the problem is near, near a city, let's say like near Los Angeles, let's say, is there's actually a microclimate that gets created by, my, by Los Angeles. Temperature and, uh, and wind and, and a whole bunch of different things get changed by a city of that size. And, and actually what happens is the smog and the release from that smog changes a much larger area around it. So, so this, this research station has to be as far as possible from the, you know, the human uh, you know, kind of weekly shifts. And, and, and Antarctica is awfully remote, so that's where Outpost Haley is, is located. And, uh, and so it's basically a research station, but from Antarctic spring to Antarctic fall, so that's, that's February to November, they're completely abandoned and isolated out at Outpost Haley. So the last ship leaves in February, and nothing arrives until November of that same year. And you've got between 14 and 32 scientists alone in this outpost in the raging Antarctic winter. It, it's mind-blowing, the logistical, engineering, and psychological challenge of that kind of isolation in Antarctica. But that isn't even the most amazing part of Outpost Haley. Because, you see, uh, Outpost Haley isn't actually called Outpost Haley. It's called Haley 6. Because, shockingly, I know, five other research stations preceded it. And so the one you're seeing up there, that's Outpost Haley 5. Oh, back one. Yeah, that's Outpost Haley 5. That's actually the one that in the 90s discovered the hole over the ozone layer that you heard about all over the news when El Nino wasn't being talked about. That was Outpost Haley 5 that originally found it. A and, and Outpost Haley's 1 and 2 were actually nothing more than wooden ice shacks. This, this like little timber frame log. And, th and the reason why these outposts are being uh, uh, constantly updated, even though they cost $35 million a piece, is because outpost research station Haley isn't actually built on the Antarctic subcontinent. So there's no land beneath it. It's on the Brunt Ice Shelf in the Weddell Sea. And, and now, I know an ice shelf sounds like bringing a, a fishing shack onto the Red River, but actually it's a little bit more than that because the, the Brunt Ice Shelf is 150 meters thick. So it's got a stable platform, but, but the, the Brunt Ice Shelf is moving out to sea at half a kilometer per year, so about five kilometers every decade. And so slowly, inexorably, each of these research, research stations are being pulled out to sea and dumped into the ocean. And, and if that weren't bad enough, snow accumulates in Antarctica. I'm not sure if you know that, but it snows a lot in Antarctica. Not, not as much as you might think, but still, you know, one, maybe two meters per year. And, and a warm, sunny summer day might get to minus 10, so it never melts. Just every year, a little bit more snow accumulates and a little bit more accumulates. And so uh, Outpost Haley 1 and 2, the, the wooden shacks, uh, they were eventually crushed by the weight of the snowpack above them. Just, just destroyed them, smashed them all in. Uh, Outpost Haley 3 was built like a reinforced steel tube bunker. So it could handle the, wa the weight of the snow. But what happened is after 15 meters of snow accumulated above it, the, the, the ventilation became such a challenge that they had to abandon the, the base. And, and several years later, this is actually a picture taken, if you know that next picture, taken a few years ago. That's Outpost Haley 3 being spat out to sea several years later. And you can see the weight of that pack of snow above it. And, and eventually, as that ice just keeps moving, just, just inexorably to the sea, and it just dumps it. Uh, Outpost Haley 4 and 5 uh, fared a little bit better. There's a bit smarter engineering involved. Uh, but eventually, a giant calving of the Brunt Ice Shelf uh, made Outpost Haley 5, essentially, the world's most expensive ice cube garnish floating in the Antarctic Ocean. So it, too, had to be abandoned. Which brings us to Outpost Haley 6, which is my favorite Outpost Haley, actually. 
So they were tired of spending millions of dollars on these things that got crushed or thrown at the sea. And so uh, I'll show you this video. This is what they built. So that's fairly impressive, and that won a big design challenge as far as what would be the most modern Haley in Antarctica. But what you just saw isn't even its most impressive feature. And, and I'm actually going to let the designer and architect Faber Manswell, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, explain to you exactly what the most impressive feature is. It has two principal engineering solutions. The first is that all the modules, and it's made up of a series of modules, the station, are raised up on hydraulic legs, which means that the legs can retract inside themselves. And those legs are supported on giant skis. So the giant, the, the hydraulics are there so that the legs can climb up out of the rising snow level because it never rises above freezing at Halley and so the snow just accumulates year on year on year. And the ski base for those legs are there so that when the time comes, the modules can be disconnected one from another lowered down and then pulled up by bulldozer to a new safer location inland using the skis as the method of transport. How many bulldozers does it take to haul one module? It's surprisingly few. Uh, one of the blue modules, which are the uh, basic building block for Halley 6, probably requires two standard bulldozers, whereas the big red module, which weighs in excess of 200 tonnes, required three bulldozers. So this building, or vehicle, or whatever it is, is a fully modular research station that can actually jack its way out of the snow, be disconnected, and transported back to safety. And so there's absolutely no reason why these can't last virtually forever. And in fact, as new uh, science and technology comes uh, along, they can just add more modules with new and later science gear, and just keep moving these things inland away from the calving glaciers and out of the snow for, I mean, for many, many decades. So it's an absolutely fascinating um, um, idea, concept for an engineering building. And see, the designers realized that year on year, the snowpack would just continue to rise. And year on year, the ice shelf would continue to pull them out to sea. And, and the environment would either crush the station or eventually just pull it where it didn't want to be out to sea and dump it. And they realized that they could reinforce these things to the nth degree. And they could defend against the snow as much as they wanted to. But, but they realized at some point in time, if they didn't have an active response, if the building didn't somehow actively respond to the surrounding environment, eventually they were going to lose to the crushing weight of the snow or just the constant pull of the glacier. And I think there's a very good general life principle in that. You see, the world we live in, the, the culture we live in, the, the places we work, the where we go to school, the people we talk to, the, the culture around us isn't neutral. It's not, a, it's not a neutral place. There are opinions and pulls of the culture around us, aren't there? Or, or maybe if I could say it better, there are actually many separate different pulls all warring and vying for your attention. And, and, and some of these aren't, aren't bad. Some of these are good. But many of them aren't the pull what you want. They, they won't... If you follow the pull of the culture around you, you won't always end up the way you want to end up, will you? There are things around us that are constantly tugging at us, and there are stresses in your, in your workplaces, in your, in your family, in the, in the people you meet, the, the difficult friendships you have, the difficult relationships you have, your, your boss, your coworker, wherever. There are stresses and tensions and old hurt and old wounds from old things done, and, and they don't go away, and new ones come, and new ones come, and new ones come. And between the culture pulling at us 
And, and the, the stresses and strains and scars of life building year on, year on in our life. We can feel crushed, pressed, and pulled in all sorts of directions that we don't want to have. We cannot have frozen faith. Our faith must, must be active. Have you ever had a moment, a time in your life, where there was a, a sense or a revelation or a, or a moment or an instant where something became clear to you? Where you understood what you wanted for your life or for your family's life or for your kid's life or your spouse's life or at your workplace or where you went to school where you understood what you wanted that place or that instance or that relationship to look like and where you felt for just even just a second that you, where you stood, had the power or the plan or the purpose to affect some sort of change. That you saw what you wanted to see and you felt like you could get there. A miraculous moment or a, or, a, or a divine revelation where you realize, I don't actually have to keep doing what I've been doing. My family doesn't have to be on the giant treadmill it's been on. The relationships I have that keep crumbling and being rebuilt only to crumble again don't need to be on that loop. And you, you, you actually believe you could make a difference. And do you remember the moment when that left? Well, probably not. Probably you never actually had that moment leave. Just bit by bit, the weight of the world pushed it down, and bit by bit, the pull of the culture and the people around you pulled it out and dumped it out to sea. And it was never an, an active choice in our mind. It's just drop by drop and pull by pull, it was either crushed or pulled out to sea. In the mid-90s, um, the open door was called the Morris Praise and Worship Chapel, which I think doesn't have quite the same ring that the open door has. And we had a different pastor there for a while. And he was a great guy. He was fun and energetic and, and vibrant, and he loved to start things. But he had a couple of flaws, and, and one of them was he liked to start things but didn't like to run them or maintain them or, or really lead them. And so he, he started something with the youth called The Gate. And then he, he promptly abandoned it and left it for the youth to run. A and so the, the Gate was this long before the drop-in center in Morris ever came to be, which actually they're at their, uh, their youth conference right now or their leaders' conference. Uh, this, this pastor envisioned a connection and a youth center in Morris that would, that would have some positive impact on the youth culture. And, and so what happened was, uh, it was basically my brother, uh, who was 16 at the time, two other people from this church who were about his age, and myself, who was 13, and, and, and this other pastor. And, and, and we, we began to build the gate in the basement of our church, which is at the corner of Lucinda and Mulvey. It's that red tin house now. It's not even a particularly large house because we weren't a particularly large church at the time. And in the basement, we built the gate. And it was a place where um, we painted it like blacks and purples. And, and uh, it was the 90s, you can forgive us. A and we put up like edgy art all over the walls. We had this canteen and we booked in these bands. And, and Manitoba, southern Manitoba, was going through this really vibrant, active sort of punk revival music scene, hardcore revival music scene. It was really active in southern Manitoba. And there were bands everywhere and so my brother uh, rick was in charge of booking the bands for the most part and i was in charge of the canteen it was kind of my duty and we'd get out kids from altona and winkler and morden and steinbeck and morris of course and and sometimes winnipeg to listen to these bands and have these bands you know just share from their life and 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 share about what god's been doing in their life with the youth who'd come out to the gate and some of these bands were terrible like objectively just abysmal and I remember, like, oh, Tinfoil and Flushing Kermit, and these are all names that none of you will know, thankfully. They were just terrible. But some of them were pretty good, and then got better. And some of them even got signed. I mean, we had John Bowler playing at this little tiny gate cafe long before anybody ever heard of him. And uh, Big Time Nobody and the Rock Band, which went on to, you know, they used to be shambles. But And if you don't know these names, that's fine. But in the late 90s, some of these names were pretty big. And they, they started playing the gate. And then they would go on and get signed and get record deals and stuff and, and go on tours across Canada or North America. And they'd always come back to the gate because we helped them get their start when they were kind of just nothing. And, and so on those nights where we'd have these bigger bands come out, we'd have 100 kids pack that basement. 120 one night, I remember. Like, that was not a big basement. They, you couldn't fit that many in there. They had to go like, in shifts and in turns. And it was hot and sweaty and packed. And I was running the canteen. And people were like, borderline dehydrated and so i would take these two fours of coke or pepsi and i would just pass them to the first guy and he would just pass them above his head and they'd all grab one and we would circle the room it would, the box would come back to me empty 
with exact change inside the box. It was an awesome culture. And these bands with, you know, 12-inch spiked mohawks and, and, and leathers and chains, they were just loving on these kids and sharing what God was doing in their life. And it was an amazing time. There was connection and there was, there was people feeling valued and, and there were really lives changed. Uh, I remember uh, sometimes the off-duty cops in Morris, they would come out just to help us with crowd control because, I mean, we were a bunch of teenagers. I was 16 when this ended. And my brother was like maybe 18 by the time this was ended. And we were just running this thing, having no clue what we were doing. And, uh, and so they would come out. We had like 80 kids there maybe on a night. And it was sweaty and hot. And they would just you know, chat with the kids and work the room. And then the one time they, they realized our emergency exit, I say in quotation marks, had no lights, no signs, and was actually just a plywood door boarded up in a door frame near the back. And the guy said, come on, at least try to pretend. I can't even pretend I didn't see that. Like, you have to at least have a door that opens for these kids. But, but they were good. They loved what we were doing because they could see it was making a positive impact on these kids. And then more kids came. And then more kids came. And then we had a problem with people snorting drugs on the steps of the church. And then we had to kick a couple of kids out because they were fighting. And then the phone call started. The parents started calling. Because their kids would say, oh, I want to go to the gate, which was this nice, awesome place. And they'd drop their kids off. And as soon as they leave, those kids would run to some other party in Morris. And then the parents couldn't find them. At 11.30, all I did was fielded phone calls from angry parents. Who were, where's my kid? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not a babysitter. I'm like 16 and running a youth cafe. Had no clue what we were doing. And bit by bit, we stopped, we stopped going where we wanted to go. And we started managing. And we just managed what was happening. We started doing crowd control. And then, and then the bands kind of started to dry up, and the bigger ones broke up and moved on, and the newer ones were, and, and the whole thing started to fall apart, and it just became a lot of work and a lot of stress. We finally canceled it. We, we shut it down. And then, many years later, when the Consume Us uh, Youth Night started up, and Brent and Jay and my brother Matt, a whole bunch of other guys, there's a bunch of people here. I see some of them in the back there that were part of that whole consume us culture started. I, uh, I'd been hearing about it for a while. I went to one of them at the drop-in center early on. And when I walked in, five minutes later, I got choked up. I got really choked up. Because it looked different, and it smelt different, and it sounded different. And they were doing different things, and there was different kids there, and it was a whole different generation. But the spirit was the same. God was doing something. And I realized, because I kind of felt bad about the way the gate ended. And, and, you know, I wish things had gone differently. But the reality was, God had been doing something. God called us to do something. And God blessed what we were doing in Morris. But then we sat down and we camped on what God had been doing. And God kept on doing more things. And we stayed frozen right where we were. And God moved on. He had more things to do. He was changing kids in a different way. He was reaching a new generation. And we just missed it. And when Consuma started out, they built on what we had done, but not on the same foundation because our faith had stayed frozen and hadn't grown with what was happening. If we stay frozen in something God has done, we never see what God will do. And we'll live with yesterday's miracles and yesterday's transformation and yesterday's change. Till the weight of the world and the stresses of our times crush us or spit us out to sea. So what's the solution? I mean, we're not, we're not stuck in this, I hope. I mean, that'd be a very depressing message. You're stuck where you are, you'll get crushed or spit out to sea. Now go home. I think there's a solution. I think there is a response. I think there is an answer because we care about our families. I mean, you care about your kids. You care about your spouse. You care about your workplace or you wouldn't be there or you shouldn't be there. You care about your school. What can you do? How do you defend against the crushing weight of the worries and stresses and scars and hassles of the life and the general pull of our culture? How do you defend against it? The answer is you don't. You don't defend. You can't defend. We don't defend. We don't sit down. We don't manage. We don't build fences and we don't build walls. Following Jesus isn't defense, it's offense. The kingdom of heaven is coming. It's an action. It's a verb. Things are happening. Following Jesus is less like building fences and more like planning an invasion. In Matthew 6, 18, Jesus says it like this. He says, and I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And by the way, that's the same church we're all a part of. Not the open door. I mean the church of Christ in this community. 
And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Gates of hell. Gates are a defense. Gates don't come towards you. You might go towards the gates. Hell is stationary. Hell just sits there. Hell isn't fiery. Hell is ice. Hell is frozen. It tries to lock people and lock relationships and lock your life and freeze it down and keep it there where it can get crushed by the weights of the world. Heaven is fiery. The kingdom of heaven is moving. It's doing something. It's taking the enemy territory in your life. It's taking the enemy territory in your family. It's taking the enemy territory in your workplace. The kingdom of heaven is coming and has now come in your life and in your workplace and at your school and with your friends and in your relationships. It is something that is happening and changing and moving and doing and making all things new. Refreshing and rejuvenating. So what what does the Bible tell Jesus' followers? Here's just a small sample. In Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go therefore. Isaiah 55, You will indeed go out with joy and be peacefully guided. You can't be guided if you're sitting down. Bert Bell used to speak at these church like, oh, this church many decades ago when I was a kid. And he used to say, a parked car can't switch lanes. You have to be moving forward to be guided. And be peacefully guided. The mountains and the hills will break into singing before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Genesis 9 verse 7. This is the, like the earliest command of God to his people. But you be fruitful and multiply. Spread out over the earth. Go, go forth, go therefore, go out, spread out, and multiply on it. First Kings 19, verse 11. Then God said, go out and stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence. And at that moment, the Lord passed by. Go out and stand. We are not the law. The light of Jesus Christ has come to us and has saved us. And we put, we put our trust in him and in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. And that light is in us. But there are people in this world who are lost, who are dying, who are hurting, who need to know the transforming power of Jesus in their life. And they're mostly out there, around you, where you work, where you live, where you breathe. The... the, the the strongholds of the enemy of the kingdom of, 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 the, of hell. They need you to go forth with the authority and the power of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, filled with the same spirit that is in you, took some illiterate fishermen and a couple of tax collectors, and he overturned the known world. That same spirit lives in us. And I know, I know what it's like when you look at the world and you see the sheer mountain and volume of the snow of stress and worry and doubt and hassle and work and struggle around you. And it builds and it builds. And the pull of the fear. I mean, there have been like five terrorist attacks I've read about this week across the world. And the pull of fear of, of people who are different. And the pull of fear of what if I fail. And the pull of fear of what if when I fail people are watching and they judge me. And it slowly pulls you as you get silent and frozen so you spit out the sea or crushed. The spirit of co- God didn't come to strengthen and build a, a bulwark or, a, or a, a fence or a wall around you so that you would last longer under the crushing weight. The spirit of God came to fulfill you, to fill you with authority, to see change come in your life. And do you want that change? Do you want to see, see power over addictions? Do you want to see a cycle of brokenness in your relationships that ends? Do you want to go to work excited because your coworkers are so awesome and your boss is gracious and you love what you do? Second Corinthians, Paul says this. He admits, he says, yeah, yeah, we are pressured in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but we are not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. And then just after that, he says, there, 
four, we do not give up. We do not sit down and stay frozen. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. Not a weight of the stress and the worry that crushes you, but a weight of glory that builds you up and rises you to be the kind of spirit-filled, conquering Christian that changes the face of every relationship he or she touches. So we do not focus on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. And you were made to be feared by the kingdom of hell and wonderfully received by the kingdom of heaven. You were made with a plan and a purpose. And even if you've completely lost sight of that under the crushing weight of the stuff around you, the, 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 the sheer volume of garbage that's floated down around you, that purpose is still there. And God longs to rise you up out of that snow and bring you to the place you were meant to be. It's never too late. It's never too late. God's plan for you, that he breathed into you when he breathed the breath of life into you as an infant, didn't change. God didn't change. His plan didn't change. The weight of the world can't crush the seed of that plan in your life. And that purpose still stands as it stood the day you first cried. And it stands today. And there's a plan and a purpose for you to achieve to see reconciliation in your life. You might be pressed, but you are not crushed. You are not crushed. So where are you at in your life? See, here's the thing. When pretty much all of us, myself included, when we face the pressures and stress, the, the, the default, our knee-jerk reaction is to double down, buckle down, guard ourselves, circle the wagons, focus on ourselves, our family, or wherever our little tight tribe is, and to hold tight and brace. It's the default human reaction. We're, we're, we're turtles. Tap our shell, we pull in. And we just brace. And as we brace, slowly the weight of the world pulls on us, and slowly we get, yeah, crushed or pulled out to sea. That's our default. The kingdom of heaven has given you authority to do something, to engage with something. So, I've got a challenge. You have kids. Do you engage with them in their faith? Because here's, here's the tendency of the world, and I've seen the stats for the North American church. The number of parents who actually engage with their kids in any meaningful way on their faith is shockingly small. But it cannot be the church's job to share and grow and flame your kids' faith into something, because here's the deal. There is no the church. There's us. We, we are the church. You are God's representative to your kids. And if you're not engaging with your kids on their faith, who is? Your workplace. Maybe you look around and you see just the, the stress and the disaster that is your workplace. And you're thinking, God, how can you allow this? How come you're not doing something? Because God is doing something. He filled you with his authority and then he sent you into that workplace. You're there. God's there because you're there. That broken relationship that just needs the light of God to shine on it. Well, guess what? The light of God is in you and you're there. You're already there. You need to engage actively with God and the struggle, with God and your family, with God and your kids, with God and your workplace, with God and your school, with God and your community. And you need to say, God, you've put me here. How can you use me? Your purpose and your plan is in me. Your light is in me. God, I'm here and I'm willing. Send me. Because we're, we're pressed, but we're not crushed. We're persecuted, but not, not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. I started singing there by accident. It's awesome. It's a great song. So I'm going to invite the band to come up. But I want to challenge you. Well, I said a lot, and there's probably a lot of thoughts rattling around in your head. Or maybe not. I'm not going to judge you if not. But Right now, here this morning, while the band plays, I want you to pick one area of your life. Your kids, your spouse, your workplace, your community. Where are you in your personal life? I just really feel like God's speaking right now to some of you. Um, where am I in your personal life? In your private time, well, number one, I think many of you don't have private time. It's go, go, go to the next thing. 
And in your private time, I think God's saying, where am I? Who and what are you putting into your private time? What do you do with your money? What do you do with your eyes? What are you looking at in your private time? What do you do with your mind? Where does your mind go in your private time? Where is God in your private time? We look around at the world around us and we see the sheer struggle of the weight and the pull. And we think, God, why aren't you doing something? If God's in your quiet time, God will show you. And he will show you what your, what your cog, what your piece of that pu- puzzle is. So I want you to pick one area. Your quiet time, your personal life, your family, your spouse, your kids, your workplace, wherever, your community. And I want you to engage with it and with God this week. Just very deliberately for this week. And ask God to show you how you can engage with that struggle or that strife. How can you pull somebody out of the snow? How can you move your life from where it is near the edge of a cliff to where it's safer in the arms of God? What is one thing you can do this week that takes what God is doing and it puts a counter to the culture of what the culture is doing on your life? And then do it. And then do it. And see God's kingdom come and his will be done in your life as it is in heaven. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, you are so mighty and wonderful. God, your spirit is alive and powerful inside of us. And Lord, we want more of that. We want to know your plans and your purpose for our life and for those around us. God, we want to be those who can rescue, who can reach down into the snow of those who've been crushed by the avalanche of garbage in this life and pull them out. I just see this image so clearly of somebody just trapped by these blocks of snow and, and, and you just reach down and, and they grab your wrist and you clasp their wrist and you pull them out and they take that first breath like they haven't breathed for minutes and they're, they're blue in the face and they gasp and you watch the color come back to their face. There are people around you who are literally dying because they are lonely, because they are hurting, because they've been rejected, because they feel rejected by God. And they're just needing a human touch, somebody to say, God cares about you, and I care about you because God cares about you. Lord, I pray that you would leave no, no one behind. Lord, I pray you give us the strength and the authority to pull ourselves out of the snow, pull each other out of the snow. God, step back from the precipice of that edge. Lord, and live in the blessing of your kingdom. And I pray you'd give us the authority as we take these stands, as we take these hills, that we would see your kingdom come in our community, in our lives, in our family, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.